Hello and welcome to this uh, fifth Excite webinar on uh, misinformation, research, engagement and reflections. It's great to see so many of you uh, logged in for this. We're really looking forward to a, a nice discussion. Uh, we're particularly grateful as well to the support of the Kavli Foundation, uh, who we've been working with closely on this topic. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm from uh, Sticky Dots in Brussels, and I've been working with the Excite team on the topic of misinformation uh, for a little while now. This started off uh, last year's pre-conference workshop uh, in Copenhagen, where it became clear there was a real appetite to tackle this topic. Uh, so this workshop brought together researchers and practitioners uh, to look at how misinformation can be addressed in science communication. Um, and it was decided then to put together a kind of resource document on the topic. Uh, that's where I came in. Uh, so what I thought was going to be quite a straightforward uh, project on interviewing uh, researchers and practitioners and uh, putting together this document turned into a series of incredibly intense, passionate conversations. It became super clear to me that there's a real sense of urgency about this topic of misinformation and almost an existential threat uh, to our sector. Uh, I chose this image uh, from Heather Beardsley, uh, who she's an artist who hides her own creations in among real scientific specimens. And I thought it summed up nicely uh, the, the confusion that comes uh, when the public is uh, presented with uh, conflicting information on science. Uh, if our mission as institutions is to engage the public on science, then what threat could be greater than a phenomenon who, which actively seeks to mislead the public? And this is where we find ourselves now, um, having put together and launched uh, this resource document in April. Uh, we wanted to open up the conversation to all of you, uh, take this opportunity um, to hear from uh, four speakers. We're really happy we have some great speakers for this session. Um, so we'll hear from uh, yeah, uh, four, four different uh, presenters, but also we really want you to be a part of the conversation as well. We're going to move from looking at cognitive aspects uh, to looking at more sociological uh, phenomena within misinformation. Um, and yeah, we'll, there'll be plenty of opportunity for you to get involved. You can uh, join the chat, as I see plenty of you are already doing. Hello uh, from uh, all over the world. Um, you can post questions and comments. So you'll see the ask a question button below. Um, and that's an opportunity to not only ask questions, but also suggest topics that you would like to, us to bring into the discussion. Uh, you can also um, vote on each other's questions and comments. Uh, so if you see a question that you really think is important, please give it an upvote. And also start the conversation within those questions and comments. You can reply to each other and uh, get the conversation going there. So not everything we have time to address on the screen because it's a huge topic. Uh, we know we can only cover a certain amount in an hour, um, but the conversation can continue in this, uh, in this chat. So please, uh, make, please make the most of it. Okay, and uh, so we've already launched a poll as well to find out a little bit, if you see just below, the little red one. Uh, there's a poll there to find out how much you've been working on misinformation so far as a topic. Um, and without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, uh, Stephen Lewandowski. Uh, he's the Chair of Cognitive Psychology at the University of Bristol in the UK, and also a professorial fellow at uh, UWA in his native uh, Australia. We're really excited that he accepted the invitation to come and join us because uh, I think if you've looked into the topic of misinformation online, you'll see that uh, he's one of the leading researchers. Um, and so we're going to hear a bit more about uh, the cognitive aspect. Uh, I'll hand over to you, Steve. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. I just need to share my screen. This is... Oh, we lost you there a second. Should be happening. I don't. Uh -huh. Well, ah, here we go. Uh -huh. Here we go. I think you can now see my screen. Very good. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. Um, this is obviously a uh, a topic that that is worthy of an entire semester at least of. Uh, a university course. So clearly I won't have time to do that. All I want to do is spend a few minutes giving you two take home messages about the cognition of misinformation. There are two key points that I want to make. Um, the first one is that misinformation sticks in people's minds, even when it is corrected. And secondly, that perceived authenticity 
may be more important to people than actual honesty under certain circumstances. And the second point, I think, is particularly pertinent in today's political uh, circumstances. So what do I mean when I say misinformation sticks? Well, basically, what it means is that we have a large number of experiments showing over and over again that once people have read something that they assume to be true by default, because we as people tend to assume that everything we see is true, and it very often is in daily life. Um, so once you read something such as this claim that the Pope endorsed Donald Trump prior to the election in 2016, then even if later on fact checkers point out that that is incorrect, and of course it was incorrect, it was completely made up, then we have lots of evidence that people still cling to that initial information despite the correction. This is known as the continued influence effect, and it is one of the most basic phenomena in misinformation research that very often misinformation sticks. Now, there is a very important qualification to this, and that is that when you correct misinformation, people very often will say, oh, yeah, it's false, but they will nonetheless act as if they still rely on the misinformation. And that is what makes it particularly difficult to deal with this because when you correct people and they say, oh, thank you, I now changed my mind, um, that sounds really good as though the correction was successful. But very often we find that they nonetheless rely on the misinformation. So what can we do to overcome that? Well, there's a number of things we can do. Uh, the one that is most promising and, again, is widely supported in the literature through meta-analyses and replications and all sorts of things. The most promising, promising thing is to provide an alternative explanation, an alternative account of the initial misinformation and why it was wrong. So rather than saying the Pope endorsed Donald Trump, no, that's false. Instead, provide an alternative account, which is actually true. Pope Francis has suggested, this was reported by the New York Times, that Donald Trump is not a Christian. So that makes it quite unlikely that he would endorse him. So under those circumstances, an alternative account, then uh, people are capable of overcoming their, their reliance on misinformation. Now, we have a second problem, and that is that in today's world, it appears sometimes as though truthfulness doesn't actually matter. Here we have statistics from United States president at the moment, Donald Trump, and uh, this is the last update I have from two weeks ago, less than two weeks ago. He has made false misleading claims 20,000 times while in office, so around 15 times a day. Now, that's a lot, but somehow it doesn't make too much of a difference to his approval ratings. Sure, more people disapprove in Donald Trump than approve, but if you look at the two trends shown on the graph here, they're relatively flat, and there clearly is no sort of discernible big trends suggesting that Donald Trump's inaccuracies have hurt him politically. So why is that? Well, to understand that, I think we understand the distinction between authenticity and honesty. And this is due to work by Oliver Hall and colleagues who published a paper a couple of years ago that I think was, was remarkable in showing that if people question the legitimacy of the system, then any norm violation by a politician is signaling authenticity. What does that mean? That means if I'm a politician who is running against the establishment, as most populist politicians do, then if people question the legitimacy of that establishment or of that system, then if I violate the norm of truth-telling, 
if I violate the norm of endorsing education and science, if I violate the norm of relating to the media in a non-confrontational manner, then that's not a bug, that is a feature. People will accept and endorse a quote unquote lying demagogue because it is the violation of the norm of honesty that is sending a signal to the person's followers that this politician or candidate is a, an authentic champion of the people. And there's evidence from experiments to suggest that that's the case because we can turn that on and off. If people feel that there is a corrupt elite or if they're feeling left out from a dysfunctional system, then they will accept politicians who lie on their behalf. If they do not feel left out or do not feel that the system is corrupt, then they will look at a lying politician and say, well, hang on, this guy is dishonest. I don't want to have anything to do with that. So the attractiveness of a politician who is dishonest, a serial teller of falsehoods, lies crucially with whether or not people feel left out by the system. And those are basically my two take home messages that we have to contend with. Number one, cognitively speaking, misinformation sticks. It sticks to people's minds once they have encountered it. And even if you correct it, they sometimes rely on it, unless we provide a causal alternative. And perhaps more troublingly still, people are okay with being misinformed, provided they are disenfranchised or feel disenfranchised by a political system, and they feel that the lies are a signal by a politician that they're an authentic champion of of the people. And to change that, we have to overcome, I think, the politics underlying populism. Thank you. That's all I have to say in my opening remarks. Thanks so much, Stephen, for that overview, which I think really sets out the scale of the challenge and is frankly quite disturbing when it comes to uh, the role that science museums and science centers need to play. Um, it's, uh, we'll be able to discuss it in more detail uh, in a moment. And please, uh, if you're watching, don't hesitate to submit your questions and comments uh, using the Ask a Question tool below. Uh, but we'll move straight on. Uh, before bringing Stephen back uh, for the discussion, we'll move on uh, to introduce our next speaker. Uh, we're really happy to have uh, Catherine Wallian along from uh, the Echo de la Médiation at uh, Universiance in France. Uh, she's been working for a couple of years now, uh, training explainers on critical thinking and uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing a bit more from her uh, about the project. And over to you, uh, Catherine. All right. I don't know if you're having some uh, troubles connecting, Catherine. We'll give it a minute. All right, so I'm hearing that you should be there, Catherine. Oh, otherwise, I'll bring Stephen back uh, to ask a couple of questions already. Um, I see there's already one popped up uh, in the chat. Uh, Stephen, would you like to join us again? Okay. Ah, Catherine, great. Hi. <laughs> you made it, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem at all. I'll hand over to you. Thanks a lot. Sorry. Um, okay. Hello, everybody. So, uh, I'm I'm really pleased to to participate to this uh, webinar. So, I'm Catherine Wallion. I work uh, in Universions as trainer. Universions is a French public establishment that comprises two science centers in Paris, the Cité des Sciences uh, et de la Découverte uh, de, et de l'Industrie et le Palais de la Découverte. Uh, I'm working on a multi-partner project called 
École de la Médiation, which is basically a training center for all professionals that engage the public with science in France and abroad. So science explainers, communicators, uh, educators. So in 2019, we organized a series of events uh, on the theme critical thinking and science facilitation. Indeed, misinformation, conspiracy theories, citizens' perception of science have been pervasive issues these last years in science centers. And despite the large number of, of resources available and the importance of the topics, many practitioners feel helpless. So our goal was to support practitioners thanks to professional meetings and the two-day training courses that we specifically designed for them. A crucial point in the Science Center strategy to tackle misinformation is to clarify the science facilitator's position. How should they react when faced to misinformation spread among the audience? Um, in, a, in a context of uh, mistrust of in institution is essential to identify the risk of a position of authority. Um, and as a science center, I think we can really be at the interface between science and society and facilitate dialogue. That's why we started the training questioning our own critical thinking. We presented research on several cognitive bias, as Stefan presented, to highlight the fact that nobody, even professional, is 100% rational. It helps being humble and therefore having a more serene dialogue with the audience. Then, to help the participants to cope with misleading statements, each of them shared a real visitor comment they couldn't easily answer. For example, I don't know, this vaccine is dangerous. Then they individually, individually choose a relevant answer among those proposed by the other participants. Through discussion between them and research data, we define recommendations so that they feel equipped when they will be faced to this kind of situation again. For example, we highlighted the importance of listening to the audience to understand why they are saying that. Why do they believe that? So it's really like being able to accept objection, but without being relativist. The second key point I'd like to point out doesn't concern the facilitation, but the design of a project uh, specifically focusing on critical thinking. And more precisely, the importance of being aware of the risks. So the first step is to make explicit our role as Museum of Science Center in the misinformation challenge in order to choose consistent activities with this goal. And the second step is to identify specific risk. For example, if your goal is to provide tools to check information, the, for the audience, you could conduct me media literacy project. But one risk could be that your tools are not transferable in real life situation. So you have to pay attention to the digital use of the targeted audience, for example. Concretely, during our training, we organize a debate where practitioners had the opportunity to have reflexive thought uh, about their goals and identify which kind of action they can uh, conduct. We discuss projects focused on debunking, on experimenting science, on organizing debate on controversial issues. The last approach I would like to talk about is called inoculation. The principle is to expose people to a weak form of misinformation in order to help them become more resistant when they encounter the actual misinformation. I'm going to give you an example with one of our projects. Last year, we organized several bad faith competitions. The goal is to enable speakers and listeners to recognize fallacious arguments or sophism in their own speeches and those of others. You're probably wondering what it looks like. 
Imagine four science explainers who defend the whimsical thesis as the moon, in, the moon is made of cheese. We have chosen an absurd thesis so that everybody can focus on the form of the speech and not the content. Speakers were asked to argue using some fallacious arguments. For example, a false dilemma is a fallacy where you present two options as mutually exclusive, whereas other possibilities exist or both can be true or false. For example, either the moon is made of popcorn or of cheese. During the competition, the audience that comprised uh, both uh, practitioner and general audience and the jury votes for the competitor that has used uh, the logical fallacies best, and therefore they find a winner. Through this event, we want to favor alertness to argument that in real life situation seems convincing but are misleading. And thus, we want to develop critical thinking skills. What's next? The COVID-19 crisis has reinforced our willing to support practitioners, and we will propose new action next year. We will have a special focus on evaluation of the practices in order to find the most efficient way to tackle the misinformation challenge in science museums and science centers. Awareness Awareness of cognitive bias will also be addressed in an exhibition uh, um, carried by Univers Science, Cap Science and Quai des Savoirs. As for argumentative bias, if you want to co organize a bad face competition, uh, for example, during an excited meeting, please contact me. So, thank you for your attention, and I hope to meet some of you tomorrow during the Excite Online Day. Thanks so much, Catherine. Uh, super interesting to hear a bit more about uh, the training practices and uh, yeah, the, what's worked and what hasn't. Um, so please keep your questions uh, coming for our speakers. I'm going to invite uh, Steve back to join the discussion now. Um, and I also, so I see from the first poll that uh, some of you have uh, done some work already on misinformation. So I'm curious to hear about your experiences and your practices as well in the questions and comments. Um, uh, we've also launched another poll to ask a, a bit about uh, how challenging you find it to link research and practice, and we'll come to that later. Uh, but first, I wanted to ask uh, our speakers, uh, so maybe I'll come first to Stephen. Uh, looking at uh, Catherine's work on training explainers in critical thinking, what are your thoughts on this as, uh, as, a, as a way of approaching misinformation? Well, I think, I think it's fantastic, and especially the inoculation stuff. There, there is a lot of evidence uh, that it works. And when you mentioned false dichotomies, I, I started chuckling because one of my project students just did a research project on this, which I marked last night. So it is incredibly topical. Um, and yes, what we did in that study, for example, was to train our participants to identify uh, false dichotomies in argumentation. And they were then afterwards able to pick out these false uh, dichotomies in quotes from actual politicians. We didn't tell them who the politicians were because we didn't want to sort of contaminate it with their, their you know, own opinions, uh, but they were able to spot that better after the training than before. So I think inoculation, teaching people how to spot bad argumentation, um, we have an increasing number of studies showing that that is uh, possible and it works. And specifically with, with relation to scientific issues, we've shown that a few times that if you tell people ahead of time about the misleading rhetorical techniques of climate deniers, for example, that they then become more resistant to being misinformed. So I think you're spot on. I think, I think this is what we have to do. And the key is to scale it up so that millions of people around the world can, can benefit from that. For example, in school, which is where I think we have to start. Right. Yeah. What are your thoughts, uh, Catherine, uh, looking at Stephen's presentation on this question of these questions of authenticity and uh, yeah, 
Well, of course, uh, I, I started to work on this project two years ago, and I, I think I'll start reading your paper, Stephen. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I find it really challenging, also because we have a lot of research uh, on that, and I find it like, too interesting to mix uh, practitioner experience and, and research data that are really sometimes really counterintuitive. Like your first post as practitioner, research will prove that it's not a good idea at all. So it's quite complicated to deal with that, but really interesting. And of course, I'm quite sure that we have to take several options and several um, kind Absolutely. of activity because it's really a complex issue. And you have people that believe the same thing, but not for the same, re same reason. And maybe you won't deal the same way with them with them absolutely i think that's crucial i mean there's different aud audiences there's different tools it's a very complex space and i'm always very reluctant and, and and sort of afraid when i when i kind of try to make general recommendations because i always know it depends on the audience but the one thing that i think works pretty well across the board is inoculation I, I think you know there's good evidence for that. Um, so I'm I'm a little bit more optimistic about that. <laughs> I wanted to ask both of you as well about this question of uh, you mentioned Stephen authenticity, and I could feel myself thinking, gosh, this is a very tough thing that authenticity depends on violating norms, and this is something that of course ethically is challenging for science centers and museums. Uh, how can we how can we come across as authentic? Well, I, I don't think I don't think you should try. I mean, competing with Donald Trump is not something I recommend. Uh, so you know, as a, as a museum, anybody else, um, the the I think the crucial, the key to this is to restore people's trust in institutions and in science and expertise. Now, my impression based on opinion poll data during the last three months or so is that um, the pandemic has one fallout from it, a positive fallout from it is that expertise has uh, become important again, that all of a sudden it matters what politicians say and do. Uh, it matters what experts do. And if you look at the opinion poll data across Europe, at least the populist parties have lost support uh, endorsement of the government in countries that have handled the pandemic successfully has gone up and the entire discourse has been uh, more oriented towards evidence and facebook all of a sudden discovered their ability to identify misinformation and they're now flagging covid related conspiracy theories by putting a big opaque mask on top of the post saying, whoa, 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 this is misinformation, which cuts access or sharing by 90%. They've done the experiment on that. And, and I trust those data. I, I know that Facebook, they know how to run experiments um, with our data. So, um, so in that sense, I think that, that has been successful. And I think we have to build on that and we have to use this as a teaching event and we can just say well look you know the pandemic the only thing we had access to was expertise trying to manage this um because the moment people trust institutions people like donald trump and all these guys they're they're they don't find any traction right catherine what's your thoughts on this that uh, the pandemic could even be an opportunity to point on the importance of the reliability of scientific expertise yeah, I, I'm quite sure we will have a lot of lessons to learn from this crisis, and we we are already um, organizing activities like in one year to have a one year later point of view with maybe research from I don't know sociology, psychology, and all that to better understand what happened and how the relationship with the audience could change in that. But yeah, I like the idea of working on trust. And that's also why we discussed a lot in our training about our role as museum, as science center. And if we talk about trust, what yeah, what can we do to to have trust from the audience? And I'm quite sure it's not saying you're wrong, I'm <laughs> I'm true. So how can we work we with, with that? Uh, and I think yeah, it's a really big challenge, but that have to be addressed. If not, we are yeah. just doing some fact checking and regarding what Stefan have said, it won't be effective.
We need to do more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to bring in here uh, our top voted question at the moment from Antonio. Uh, he asks, does efficiency of correction of misinformation depend on the perceived legitimacy of the person correcting it, so the source, or us as museums, or does it just depend on the message? So this seems relevant to me in this context. Yeah, do, do you want me to answer that? I mean, sure. I saw the question and I thought, oh, okay. So I looked up the paper that answers the question. Uh, which, or one of them I know of, by Guyeri and Garachi, published, I think, in 2013, so some time ago. They manipulated both expertise and trustworthiness of um, the correction. And it turned out that um, what matters is trustworthiness. It is not expertise per se. They tried to disentangle in the experiment expertise and trustworthiness and expertise turns out not to matter provided you trust the person so again it boils down to trust and somebody who's perceived as being trustworthy is uh, better able to correct misinformation than others so we again have to live with that and uh, think of ways of enhancing trustworthiness and also to guard against our trust being eroded because it's not a coincidence that people don't trust climate scientists no it's not a coincidence it's a billion dollars a year being spent by on uh, on misinformation to undermine climate science and the same is true of you know the tobacco industry in the past and all that so uh we have to be a little bit savvy in 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 also understanding the politics of this Okay, and yeah, for you, Catherine, I can see that uh, somebody's asking in the chat, Kate is asking, uh, is conceding that you don't know everything a way to build trust. And I suppose this speaks to your work on with explainers uh, on ensuring that they come across okay. as trustworthy. Is I, I'm, I'm not sure if there is research exactly on that, but I'm quite sure <laughs> uh, that, uh, that, yeah, one strategy we discussed with the explainer is also feeling more comfortable with what their own value, their own skill, their own expertise, and yeah, not trying to put themselves in an authority position because they feel attacked. Because I think at the end, it doesn't help for the trust issue. But okay. maybe we have to test that more precisely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both so much. I'm sorry to uh, cut this conversation short because I feel like we could uh, go on forever. And I would also like to invite you both um, to join the conversation in the question box. Uh, yeah. so um, and feel free to also post your own questions and comments uh, to keep the conversation going there. But thank you both so much for providing those uh, two perspectives. I think it's got us off to a great start. Um, so yeah, please uh, keep the questions coming. And uh, it's a pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, uh, Brian Southwell, uh, who is Senior Director of uh, the Science in the Public Sphere program at RTI International in the US. And his academic roles include uh, that of adjunct professor at the Social Science Research Institute at Duke University. And he's also the host of a radio program and podcast, uh, The Measure of Everyday Life, uh, which I saw has just uh, started again after a, after a hiatus uh, mm -hmm. over the last few weeks. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, we're very happy to welcome you along uh, to look at the more sociological aspects. Great. Well, it really is a pleasure to be here, and, and what a wonderful group uh, you've assembled. I, I want to uh, thank everybody uh, for taking time out of their day. Um, there's so much going on in the world um, you know, right now, and so for you to spend an hour um, focused on, on these issues, um, we really appreciate it. So I, I want to continue to contribute to the conversation. I think a lot of what um, I'm going to say is going to resonate um, in direct ways, um, actually, with both of the, the previous speakers, and so I, it's really heartening to hear um, a lot of that. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, just could me a moment and okay so I, I wanted to offer just a, a few additional remarks um, to help um, put everything in context um, to some extent. Um, I think in many ways to uh, connect certainly to um, a psychological perspective, but also to think about um, the societal context in which um, you know, misinformation you know, often resides. Certainly um, in many situations in recent years, it's uh, felt like we are awash in misinformation. Um, it's particularly been the case uh, with regards to um, COVID-19 
and medical misinformation. And, and that misinformation has ranged from you know, the dramatic um, to the more mundane. Um, you know, instances in which people are offering all kinds of um, you know, home remedies. Um, and also there's been larger, more uh, conspiratorial thinking about um, lots of different dimensions. What's true though, in, in this particular case is something that um, we've realized about misinformation more broadly. Um, and, as, and that is that in, in a lot of ways, we are facing a situation uh, you know, that's going to be persistent um, that is uh, going to be with us you know, for a while, that there are um, important approaches that I think we need to take if we are to, um, to offer remedy uh, you know, here. Uh, and so this conversations like this are an important first step. Um, Dr. Lewandowski just mentioned a, a moment ago, um, at the end of the day, we have to live up to the, and, and realize that um, you know, as humans, uh, we are uh, biased towards acceptance of information. Um, and that's a, a first step. It doesn't mean that people don't in, uh, you know, have critical uh, thinking capacity in order to be able to make sense of um, information as being true or false, but that's a subsequent step you know, often that happens. When we first encounter information, we tend to accept it. And so that's a starting point that I think um, actually is important for us, though, because it's the basis for empathy um, for other people and for ourselves. Um, and that's actually going to be a path that I think we need to eventually go down. Um, it's also the case that um, we spread information for all kinds of reasons. Uh, some of it has to do with you know, its veracity, but some of it has to do with our effort to bond with other people. Um, some of it has to do with our effort to signal um, our, our um, you know, community. You can imagine, you know, in, in the days, uh, you know, if you think back a few months in instances when we were all still uh, sharing elevator space, you know, together, if you get into an elevator um, you know, with somebody and you both have just come in from outside, you have a conversation about the weather, that conversation isn't necessarily providing new information per se, um, but it is a way of signaling that I see you, you're part of my community. And so we do this quite a bit. We do this online and social media. We do this in our everyday lives. And I think misinformation and information often are currency for relationships building. So we have to keep that in mind as well, because it signals the types of misinformation that are likely to spread as people inadvertently are trying to build relationships with other people. It's also the case that um, misinformation is not going anywhere anytime soon uh, because of the nature of our media systems. And, that, and the, that those media systems are set up in a way that um, I don't think we would want necessarily the alternative. Uh, in many uh, societies around the world, um, we have a situation where uh, the, regula the regulation of uh, media is such that we look at, detect, um, and do something about um, you know, misinformation after it's appeared. That's different than censoring it from ever appearing in the first place. And so uh, our systems are often leaky, um, especially online. And it's the case that we um, have to deal with the appearance of misinformation after the fact. So as professionals, as science communication professionals, I think we have to acknowledge that many of our audiences are going to encounter this kind of information. And there's little we can do about it necessarily just appearing, um, although certainly some of the social media platforms have taken steps to, to label it. Um, you know, but nonetheless, we still have to assume that people are going to be able to encounter at least some information misinformation online. And lastly, um, correction is possible. Um, I think it's, it's, it's important to, to state that, but it's very difficult. Um, and there are continuing, not only can be echo effects, but um, it can be difficult to even accomplish this. You have to be very explicit you know, often um, and to offer, uh, as uh, again, we, we heard earlier, um, an alternative account. But I, I want to point to, um, you know, the actual nature of the spread of misinformation here is a route towards um, you know, looking ahead to the, the future and what we might do about it. I want to look um, actually uh, to Australia, a case that uh, that uh, Stephen might be um, you know, familiar with, um, a woman by the name of Belle Gibson um, in recent years, who's rose to fame and prominence by virtue of her um, effort to tout um, nutritional means of overcoming cancer. And she um, suggested that this was the way that she, in fact, um, overcame cancer herself. Um, turns out, unfortunately, there's a real problem with her story is that she never had cancer. Um, the whole story that she told was fraudulent. And so that in and of itself is ethically really problematic. But I actually think part of the story is the fact that she was able to rise to such pro to such um, fame. And, and that's something that has as much to do with audiences and our own needs and our own interests as anything else. I think in a lot of ways, we actually tend to misunderstand our own vulnerability to misinformation and looking to point a finger at you know the dramatic examples of misinformation that are out there. And so there are a few assertions that I'd like to make that I'm hopeful aren't controversial. Um, the first is that as, as social beings, we need connection with other people. Uh, we see this certainly in the, in the case of the pandemic, but you know, more broadly, we are social animals. And that means that we're gonna continue to share information with one another. Um, second, uh, we need hope for the future. 
And uh, that's something that is important to recognize about our humanity. But it's also the case that I, if either of these, social connection or hope for the future, are missing, that opens the door. Um, if misinformation diffusion might offer some kind of salve, um, that's actually a situation in a recipe where misinformation seems to most likely to spread. So given that um, diagnosis, what can be done about all of this? Well, there are many things, and conversations like this are a really important part of it. We certainly need to continue to build the empirical literature. Um, we've had a chance to do that in recent years uh, with a book um, called Misinformation in Mass Audiences. There's a, a great and robust you know, literature that's building, um, looking at both the prevalence of misinformation and its effects. Specifically, in the case of um, you know, COVID-19, there's a lot of work that could be done. Uh, some of my colleagues at RTI uh, International are doing that work um, to look at perceptions and misperceptions. And so there's an empirical base that needs to be continued to be built. But it's also the case that we need to think practically about reaching out and a really important through line and theme uh, that was also mentioned in the first half of the discussion here is the importance of trust. This is, here's a, a photograph um, from uh, one of the events that many of you are familiar with, some of you participated in, uh, you know, where we had that uh, workshop, the Excite workshop, um, you know, on addressing misinformation. And important to this was the way that we framed it um, as being something that was going to be, go beyond fact checking and that was really going to be about community building and trust building as much as anything else. Um, in recent years, um, actually last summer, I was able to put together uh, a meeting here in the United States um, for nonprofits and um, foundations focused on what it is that we might be able to do to build and maintain trust in science. And we already have seen in the first half of our discussion why that turns out to be an important um, you know, set of activities relative to misinformation. So start, we start out thinking about misinformation and its problem as it's plaguing us. Ultimately, a lot of this is going to go to um, the question of how it is we can build trust in the first place as a preventive move um, to make sure that people are paying attention to the institutions that we want them to be paying attention to. One institution that seems to continue to matter um, are, is healthcare. Um, and we know that people do tend to trust you know, their clinician um, in many instances. And so there's a, an opportunity to work with clinicians um, to deal with the situation where patients um, you know, bring misinformation into the examination room. I've had the great opportunity um, at Duke University uh, you know, recently to put together a workshop for clinicians that we are expanding into a, a large scale program um, that's going to be focused on um, building uh, capacity for empathy uh, you know, in clinicians and for um, thinking about practical ways that clinicians, physicians and nurse practitioners and others can actually talk with their patients um, you know, and not necessarily dismiss them, not to shame them, um, but rather talk with them about why it is that they were interested in particular pieces of misinformation and what it is that might be done um, to direct them to, to more credible information. Um, for those of you that are interested, uh, you know, just yesterday, um, American Scientist um, posted a piece um, that they invited me to write um, specifically thinking about the pandemic um, and misinformation. And I reflect on some of these ideas there um, you know, as well, because I think as we think about in an outward way, looking at misinformation, we also have to turn inward to think what it says about all of us you know, collectively as humanity. That seems to me to be a really healthy place to, um, to go uh, and a, a good starting spot um, you know, here. So I, I thank you very much uh, for being part of the conversation. Um, I look forward to continuing that conversation uh, more. I'll turn the, the slide and the floor back over to you. Thanks so much, Brian. And uh, thanks for speaking to our sector so directly as well. I think uh, yeah, the point you make about the social role, uh, the, so the importance of the social aspects of uh, misinformation, I think that's something that really speaks to us as institutions. I can already see in the chat um, people are interested. Yes. Uh, so we'll bring you back in a moment uh, for some more conversation. Mm -hmm. And again, please don't hesitate to keep the questions coming. Um, but before that, I will invite our final speaker, uh, Andrea Franz Pittner, uh, to join us. So, Andrea is uh, CEO of the Natur Erlebnis Park, uh, Science Education Center in Graz, in Austria. And she's been uh, developing the Immersive Newsroom project, which, is, which aims to engage teenagers on the challenging topic of misinformation. So, I'll hand over to you, uh, Andrea. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I was not alone developing this project. We were a, a very great team. And uh, Michael, please, please could you do the slides? Yes. Um, some of our team members, Astrid Rampula and Sylvia Grabner, are also here in the chat and they're going to answer your questions during this presentation. Uh, I'm going to give you a short glimpse into uh, our project Immersive Newsroom and the experiences we did. Um, Michael? 
Next slide. Okay. Uh, this project, uh, we have been working for more than a year, uh, aimed on developing an interactive format uh, based on the critical reflective review of different sources of information. And uh, this runs to enable reflection of one's own opinion formation process. We wanted to use this uh, setting also to dive into a topic that is controversial, controversially discussed. And we wanted to give uh, this uh, diving into the topic in a thematically as well as an emotional um, way. We developed this project in an iterative process uh, following in a design-based development uh, uh, process. And we uh, did it as a participatory project involving potential stakeholders and users. We called them our smarties because they were really smart. And uh, that's the way we came to uh, a product in the end. Um, con uh, which contained uh, lots of different elements, which was on one hand great, but on the other hand, uh, uh, big challenge and uh, sometimes how prob problematic. Uh, the elements of the setting contained the immersion into a narrative framing. We wanted to get the people uh, emotionally involved as well as cognitive. Uh, we provided actions to collect information, to assess information, to post statements based on the available information but on the other hand, getting confronted with contradictory information, discussing with others that have other information and reflect on the own uh, reactions to the different information sources. And uh, finally looking uh, on one's own process, how to evaluate information and form opinions. Next slide. Uh, we uh, developed lots of different sources in, of information uh, uh, concerning the topic and those uh, differences also were formed the base uh, of the judging of the uh, information of the uh, credibility of the information. So uh, we uh, did various sources from, from uh, celebrities talking about the topic up to scientific publications or personal experiences and anecdotes of people. Those informations had different quality, different intentions, and we built in some mechanisms of misinformation in some of the uh, information sources. So here are some impressions and uh, here you see the narrative framing, some, some pieces of our decoration and dramatization. Uh, we provided a story about activist groups uh, involving uh, to uncover group things and uh, posting them on the internet. Uh, the, the audience formed different teams and those uh, got lots of information of different sources and tried to form a statement based on these informations. And the different groups had different informations um, and got in contact to each other. We selected a topic that was uh, enough controversial to get into discussions, but not too emotionally charged so that the focus uh, is more on, uh, was more on, on the process of uh, decision making and judging of informations. Um, we had uh, lots of elements that created the, the group process that uh, formed uh, teams that felt belonging together. And uh, so uh, by providing them different informations, we created somehow artificial bubbles of uh, information. So our uh, 
activists were in their home base selecting their uh, sources and then in a pub situation they had to talk while drinking beer and and eating with other uh, guests of the pub their uh, opinions and uh, the, we did this through several circles and uh, in the end all the, of the groups had the same uh, informations collected and uh, they reflected their process uh, of uh, uh, decision making of getting attitudes toward the topic and in the debriefing the main questions were uh, what made me uh, find a new uh, opinion, what make me, made me change my mind, did I change my mind, what are elements that are uh, from, uh, that make cre uh, information credible for me, and uh, what uh, do I think about this, uh, this process of decision making. Our experiences were uh, on one hand really great. Uh, the setting seemed to be very appealing and the topic we, we, this, we chose superfood uh, was uh, received very well. Uh, we had lively discussions. Uh, what didn't happen is that the attitude towards the subject cha has changed. It, during this process, but this was not our main focus. Uh, participants told us, okay, uh, what I thought about superfood was is the same as before, before but uh, we appreciate very much uh, getting aware of mechanisms of misinformation and uh, being aware what are my own criteria for credibility and how could I question uh, and how to question them. Uh, so uh, uh, a big challenge for us was to get th these different concerns uh, in in one setting. We we saw that uh, we just touched on, on the surface those uh, those aims. So. Um, at, at the moment, our goal is to uh, enable a flow in uh, experiments uh, and develop a, a practicable, ambiguous format uh, and which, which balances between self-directed and targeted moderate acti activities. Uh, this is not possible in, in one setting, so in, in our development process now we plan to do a modular system focusing on the uh, single goals into a, a deeper uh, uh, way and uh, combine those to a, a series of, of modules. So, if you want to hear more, uh, you can uh, either ask us in the discussion now or uh, uh, here are our contract uh, addresses. Thanks so much, Andrea, for uh, yeah all this information. There's so much to draw on there and I feel uh, we're pressed for time to, uh, to get through it. But I'd like to bring uh, Brian back uh, to discuss this with us a bit further. Um, and I was interested to ask you uh, first, Brian, um, I'll wait for you to pop up. I wanted to know what your thoughts were about a project like Andrea's where uh, teenagers are engaged in this co-creation process. Um, but maybe first I can, well, uh, Brian's coming back. I can ask you, uh, Andrea, what you thought about Brian's presentation. Um, and, oh, and I, I thought it, it was great. And I saw several points uh, where we touch each other, uh, especially these uh, health topics uh, and those celebrities talking about some uh, scientific stuff. Uh, so I, I think uh, it's, it's those presentations fit well together. Yeah, what, what's your thoughts, Brian, on, on this kind of co-creation process and 
Hello. Yeah, no, I, I think it's crucial. I mean, it, it, it um, relates directly to that, you know, the theme of trust uh, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that uh, we have to do a better job of recognizing that um, it's not a matter of us um, you know, sitting and cr crafting, creating you know, exactly what we're going to just distribute you know, out into the world, but also thinking about our relationship audiences, thinking about our relationship to other partners, other institutions, um, that's, that has to be part of our way through this. Uh, and so I, I think it's not wrong to, to recognize that science communication professionals have a special role, um, but it's something that we might think about as um, you know, a translational role, as building bridges, as being a hub, um, and which are crucial in systems, um, but which also are in relation to the rest of, um, of audiences, other institutions, scientists, um, and, and not to be thinking about us as acting, you know, in isolation to somehow deliver the truth um, you know, to people. So um, I think it's important. Yeah, something that struck me about both of your presentations was this focus on uh, our knowing our audiences. And that that's really a science, a science center's role is to know the public very well. Um, what, what was your experience there, Andrea, with this particular challenging uh, group of teenagers? Uh Yes, uh, what we found out, we had we had a mixed setting of stakeholders and teenagers to try the setting. And we see that young people have spe special needs that differ much from older people. The, the elder ones like to discuss and get some, some structures and get some papers, but young people prefer to get really involved in, in an, an interactive way. They don't want someone to, to teach him how, mm -hmm. how I know the stupid one. Uh, we, we have to do this in an, in an empowerment way. And we try not to give them right answers, but empowering them to question. And this is a way that works well with young people, uh, involving lots of self guided uh, uh, procedures, not one person, one, one clever person telling them what's wrong in their opinion, but uh, giving them the, the, the feeling that they are able to question and uh, giving them uh, the opportunity to do it themselves. That's, that's a point that I think is very important in this misinformation that we don't sure. have this hierarchy of clever and stupid. Right. And it sounds like it fits with uh, the sort of stance you're suggesting we take, Brian. Yes. No, I think that's that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wanted to uh, come to the uh, questions uh, from our participants because I can see there's some a couple of interesting ones on the nature of scientific research and the problems that that poses mm -hmm. for us as institutions. Uh, so Walter asks, uh, what about the impact of dysfunction in scientific research? So, for example, with the recent Lancet study that was uh, retracted, that clearly shakes public trust in science and how can we as institutions deal with that? Yeah, I, I think we we need to really focus on this um, because I think there's uh, insufficient understanding of how um, the peer reviewed science works. I think insufficient acknowledgement of you know, some of the challenges, you know, as well. And, and, and also, um, you know, there's a Constellation of institutions here. Uh, journalists are involved as well, and so I think the rush. My, my old colleague Gary Schweitzer would say that you know part of the part of the issue is that um, some of this has gotten you know, reported breathlessly, you know, in, in headlines, um, you know, and as though one study, you know, indicated a, a massive you know change in terms of the trend you know, in the literature too. And so I think that the the. the it, it, it is okay um, for uh, results to conflict over time. It's the iterative nature of science. We have to, you know, really give people a more of a sense of that, to be and almost inoculate them against that, you know, that possibility happening, and to give people a, a greater sense that what we ought to be looking at here is um, the, the collective body of evidence. Um, and I think if if people are trusted. Um, you know, to be doing the best they can to try to find ways through the path, you know, here through the darkness to, um, you know, to come up with uh, new solutions for everybody, more leeway. Um, but in instances when you don't have um, acknowledgement or understanding of the, the shared humanity between you know, scientists and, and the rest of, you know, um, society that that can lead to you know, a problem as well. So a lot of this, I think, we could be um, planning ahead for the challenges we're going to be facing a year, two, three years, four, four years down the road um, by greater pulling the curtain back, shedding light on the nature of science. We saw in the stream in there, I think, you know, diversifying, um, you know, who it is it's working in and representing, you know, um, the different communities in science. Um, and, and I think that will really help um, in the future. Absolutely. 
Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask Andrea, what are your thoughts on this? And maybe to bring in a question from David, which also relates to the scientific process, um, which is the problem of cherry picking, that uh, very often misinformation picks out uh, scientific research, which does support it, but which doesn't respect the broader scientific, scientific consensus. Yeah. This was uh, a main focus of our uh, uh, process. We, we uh, used several ways of misinformation and one was to present only selective parts of a, of a, a scientific project. So for example, giving just one, one side and uh, opposing one part of them and graph or uh, giving uh, uh cutting an interview with a scientist uh and giving just one sentence out of it and so uh not really lying but uh, giving misinformation by reducing and selecting uh this is is really uh good to transport in such a setting uh, for example, if you give a video where you have one sentence of the interview and then the whole sentence, whole video, uh, people realize this uh, mechanism of misinformation. Right, providing a bit of additional context. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Brian, did you have any further thoughts on this? Yeah, no, I uh, I know given time, if, if you want to get to some other questions too, we can do that. Or if we've got time for maybe one more. Yeah, let's squeeze one last one in. Um, so. Uh, the next, I'll just go to the next highest voted one, which uh, from Barbara asking about uh, what makes up this notion of trustworthiness. Uh, mm. What factors are within that? Are they, can they be universal? Can they be influenced? How do we yeah. make ourselves trustworthy? Yeah. So I, you know, there, there's been um, a fair amount of attention paid to you know, one's own personal presentation. You know, here is whether you come across as warm and friendly and all that, and that may well play some role. But I, I, at the end of the day, we also have to think about this somewhat economically. Um, you know, part of it is a perception of shared interest. Um, you know, and I think that that's something that um, can be communicated. We all do share interests, you know, often with the, the audiences we're trying to serve. But we have to recognize that that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how charismatic or, or friendly or, or other, otherwise, you know, somebody seems to be in terms of personality. If there's a sense that at the end of the day, you and I are not in the same boat, that, um, you know, we're not our fates aren't tied somehow, um, that is a, a recipe for mistrust. And so I think that that's... Um, that to me is is important, and I think we probably need to do a better job of um, of pointing out, um, you know, that that basis. Um, but it's a, it's a it's a cold reality that um, I think that's part of the equation. So, Andrea, yeah, this idea of shared interest. Uh, yes, I I see this trust of the uh, topic a bit ambivalent. Uh, if we want people to be critically, it's. I, th I feel that it's it's not the way that I say, oh, I'm trustworthy. Uh, believe me, I have the better arguments. I'm a nice person. But uh, making them be critically and questioning everything and uh, uh, helping them to realize their own criteria of trustworthiness. Do I believe someone whom I know? Do I believe someone who has a title? Do I believe someone uh, who is the, a nurse in the hospital? Or some, some uh, mechanisms work uh, really strong to, and for example, commercials uh, write this very good, um, this imagination of trustworthy persons selling you things. So my, my uh, direction is more uh, trust nobody at the first moment and uh, find your criteria if the information is trustworthy. Okay, gosh. Yeah, this again, this conversation could run and run, but unfortunately time has got the better of us. But uh, I like that point on which to end this question of uh, trustworthiness and demonstrating our shared interest and shared humanity. And I want to thank both of you and uh, to all four of our speakers for a really fascinating conversation. I've learned a lot. Um, and thanks all to all of you uh, participants as well um, for joining in the conversation, both in the chat and asking your questions. Um, I just want to uh, draw your attention to um, a few last points. Um, so of course to say thank you, but also uh, to remind you that um, you can click below uh, for the Excite resource document on misinformation, um, that you can share this discussion. We've recorded this webinar and uh, you can use the same link to come back and find it later. Um, uh, tomorrow is Excite Day, uh, as Catherine mentioned. 
Um, we start at 10 in the morning Brussels time. Uh, so please join us online and use the Excite app to connect with us. Uh, so the keynote is at 10 tomorrow. And uh, this time next week, uh, it will be the final Excite webinar of the series. It's a Pecha Kucha. It looks really interesting. It's called Outstandingly Good, but not from us. It is about uh, inspiring uh, exhibits and activities uh, from other science centers and museums. Um, so I want to thank you all again for your participation. Yeah, I agree, it's been way too short and I hope to uh, continue the discussion with all of you very soon. Thanks a lot.